Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jennifer Nuzzo, and I'm the director of the Pandemic Center here at the Brown University School of Public Health. Thanks for joining our conversation today. Um, overall, COVID-19 related mortality has been on a downward trend here in the U.S. Um, for all age groups since early January. Uh, but what we see is that the U.S. is still reporting upwards of 300 COVID deaths each day. These are staggeringly high numbers if you consider what that amounts to on a weekly, monthly, yearly basis. These persistently high deaths prevent us from moving from on from COVID-19 as a health emergency and threaten to further erode U.S. life expectancy, which has seen historic declines since the pandemic start. In particular, people over the age of 65 remain a risk, the risk group that's most um, at risk for severe illness and death compared to other age groups. And what we're seeing today is that the majority of deaths occurring are in those over the age of 65. And in particular, those who are 85 years of age or older have been accounting for more, you know, almost half of the deaths um, that we are seeing recently in the United States. So what we're hoping to do today is to take, take stock of this. Why is this happening? Um, one area that we're going to look at is um, vaccines, and um, in particular that despite very high initial uptake of vaccines among older Americans, there has been concerningly low uptake of booster vaccines in the 65 plus population and in nursing homes. So why is this and what does it mean for protecting older Americans and those living in nursing homes? We also know that there have been important changes in other protective measures, such as testing and masking. So we need to understand what these changes mean for the urgency of protecting older Americans and nursing home residents for the purposes of making sure that we can drive down these uh, um, high levels of deaths we continue to see each day. So that's gonna be the purpose of this discussion. And to help us better understand this issue and to chart a practical path forward, I am very fortunate to be joined today by three top scholars and practitioners who have very clear expertise on these matters. It's my absolute pleasure to welcome to the discussion, Dr. Elizabeth White, who is an assistant professor of health services policy and practice here at Brown, as well as a board certified adult geriatric primary care nurse practitioner at the PACE Organization of Rhode Island. Uh, Dr. White's research primarily focuses on medically complex older adults and their experiences well with healthcare services. Um, and she has also looked closely um, at factors um, related to um, uh, um, related to quality outcomes in long-term care and primary health uh, nursing and primary health care workforces and the extent to which those factors um, Im impact quality outcomes. Uh, during COVID-19, um, uh, Dr. White worked with nursing home electronic health records to track COVID outcomes and to see how it was handled in the nursing home setting. So very relevant experience. Uh, we're, off, we're also joined by Dr. Um, Stefan Gravenstein, who is the David S. Greer Professor of Geriatrics in the School of Medicine and Professor of Health Services in the School of Public Health here at Brown. He is also the Director of the Division of Geriatrics and Palliative Medicine at the Alpert Medical School at Brown University. He's also the Associate Director of the Center on Innovation and Long-Term Services and Supports at the Providence Veterans Administration Medical Center. Uh, Dr. Gravenstein has a very large research portfolio, but it includes um, aging and quality improvements in healthcare, and particularly in the context of vaccines and long-term care settings. And then last but certainly not least, we're joined by Dr. David Gifford, Chief Medical Officer at the American Healthcare Association, which is the largest association in the country representing long-term and post-acute care facilities. Dr. Gifford serves on the Board of Advancing Excellence in America's Nursing Home Campaigns, and he previously served as the Director of the Rhode Island Department of Health and Chief Medical Officer for Quality Partners of Rhode Island, where he directed uh, programs related to CMS and, and healthcare quality. So with these three experts, we have a tremendous amount of experience on these particular topics. So I want to get into the conversation um, with you all and let's sort of keep it conversational. But, but as a fundamental question that I'm going to throw out to all of you, because you each see a different piece of this in the work that you do, where are we today in terms of the impact of COVID-19 on older Americans or nursing home residents. Um, Betsy, I'll start with you. Just give us your overall perspectives of, of where we are. And if you wanna sort of sketch where we started as a way to um, you know, make some comparison, um, feel free to do that. 
So I think from the um, beginning of the pandemic, older adults, particularly frail um, older adults living in long-term care settings, have been one of the highest risk populations. If we all remember back to you know the initial weeks of the pandemic, the initial epicenter of the COVID pandemic in the United States was a nursing home out in, in Washington. Um, to date, the federal numbers, at least in nursing homes, um, su suggest that there's been about 1.5 million or over 1.5 million residents um, that have had COVID um, and upwards of about 160,000 deaths among residents, and then about another one and a half million uh, cases among nursing home staff, and then um, close to 3,000 deaths among uh, nursing home staff. And when we look at the older adult population more broadly, um, you know, they continue to be um, the highest risk for, for adverse outcomes. Um, the, the vaccines have, have absolutely been life-saving prior to the deployment of the vaccines um, in early winter of 2020 or, or, or December 2020, uh, early winter 2021. Um, the uh, deaths in long-term care represented about 40% of, of all deaths in the, the pandemic. Um, we've seen deaths in nursing homes in particular drop dramatically as a result of vaccinations. And, and thankfully, um, you know, even though cases have continued to vary over the course of the pandemic, uh, the death rates, at least in more recent times, have, have been significantly lower, thankfully. So um, vaccines have, have definitely been life-saving um, for older adults more broadly, but particularly those who are functionally impaired um, and particularly frail residing in, in long-term care. Thank you. Those, I mean, those are just really stunning and staggeringly uh, high numbers. And, you know, I think when you've been tracking this uh, pandemic for now three years and, and seeing the numbers sort of tick up, there's that risk that we sort of see them as numbers and not as human beings and family members and, and live loss. And so I, I want to make sure that we reflect on the the incredible tolls, not just in terms of the the magnitude and the numbers, but but the the human lives um behind that. Um let me turn to to, to um Stefan and and um and you know you've you've also seen this in your work. Do you have anything that you want to reflect on over the past uh, couple of years or sort of where we are now in terms of the threat to COVID-19? Yeah, I think there's there's two parts. One of them is um, the way we are counting what's happening is in people dying, but it's a that's the tip of the iceberg. There's much more happening beyond that, and it isn't just that people get sick and um, don't fully recover. It's that also a, a fair proportion, maybe as many as twenty percent, get long COVID, and um, it appears that vaccines can prevent uh, both long COVID as well as the uh, starker things like uh, uh, dying. A, a second problem is that although it sounds like uh, counting cases is easy, it's not easy. I think we underestimate uh, what the impact is. And part of it is, is people have other things going on and they can die with COVID or from COVID and it's hard to parse which bucket they fall into. Um, and depending on uh, a variety of factors that uh, facilities don't control, they may get, might get counted one way or the other. And I think the third thing is, is the toll, um, and, and Betsy alluded to this, isn't just in the residents, it's also on staff. Uh, staff had had an incredible challenge in managing this. Uh, uh, they, they, they have challenges with resources and reimbursement and other kinds of things that allow them to do their job uh, as, as well as we would wish. And through no fault of their own, um, they often get thrown under the bus as somehow not doing their job properly. They actually do a remarkably good job considering the resources they have. Yeah, that's a good segue maybe to turn to GIF and your reflections on this. I, you know, I remember in, in tracking this that in that first year of COVID, first of all, our understanding of the U.S. experience with COVID, we have to remember, started with an outbreak in a nursing home. And that was really quite devastating to watch. But over the course of um, the last three years, but certainly over that first year, I mean, the, the tolls among residents in nursing homes was staggering. I mean, at some point, you know, accounting for almost half or more of the deaths that we are seeing in the United States. So um, on that front, can you kind of paint the experience for what it has been like for nursing homes um, and long-term care facilities, um, other such facilities for the past three years and sort of, you know, um, where, where were we and, and where are we now? 
I think it's been devastating is the best word to use. Um, in every in every way you can imagine. Um, you know, when you have a respiratory virus that's more infectious than influenza, that disproportionately affects people with chronic diseases, uh, elderly, and you have them in a congregate living situation, that's just a recipe for disaster. And that's exactly what we saw, it was just a disaster. Um, <clears throat> couple that with what I would say is pretty overt ageism in the country. Um, you know, we have the highest risk population that everyone talks about all the time. And uh, it was months to years before we got the adequate resources. You know, we were never a priority for testing, never a priority for PPE, never a priority for extra staff. It went to hospitals, it went to a lot of different places. And that, that was an added insult, I think, to the residents, the families, and to the staff that worked there, as Stefan said. And so that, you know, the staff in the facilities are some of the most passionate, caring individuals I've worked with in my career. You know, I've worked in a lot of different settings. And so, you know, the, a lot of the residents don't have family or don't have family close by to visit. So they treat them as if they're their family. And so many of these staff were coming in, not not clear in the early phases what the risk they're putting their own family to to take care of the elderly and they're watching their essentially their family members die in front of them and they were dying at a huge rates as stefan was saying i mean before the vaccine became available the mortality rate was 20 percent um hospitalization rates were huge and so yeah this was just a devastating impact and the the psychological trauma that the workforce has gone through, I don't think has been adequately addressed uh, with that. And it really wasn't until the vaccine became available that we've actually seen a change in the dynamic. If you look at all the disease curves and death curves and everything else, they just, I mean, the, the vaccine is, uh, is a miracle. That's the only way I can put it. It's been, a, it's been really a miracle. And it was the only time we were made a priority uh, for that process. So maybe can I draw you out a little bit when you talked about GIF, um, sort of not being a priority um, for some of these, you know, life-saving tools initially prior that were available prior to vaccines, such as personal, personal protective equipment and, and testing. But what did it mean for health systems in communities when there were outbreaks in nursing homes? I can imagine, just given the exquisite susceptibility of the patient population and then the, the medical needs that those patients would have, where do they become infected, that that would be quite stressful um, that it almost seems at odds with what you had said, which is just that the hospitals got were, were designated a priority as those as though those two things sort of were not intricately linked. No, they yeah they weren't. I mean, early on, you know, we we saw the outbreak started in in, in uh, on the East Coast in New York area. At one point early on in New York, I think it was like April or May, we were doing some work for the state. Um, and there were a number of nursing homes, about four or five, where the medical director, administrator, and DON had all died from COVID, and they didn't have any of them there. Um, and they were just trying to figure out how to get by. Um, and I would say early on in the pandemic, I would get calls saying, can we use and fill in the blank for PPE? You know, raincoats, ponchos, trash bags, you name it. Does that work? How do we make our own masks? Because we just didn't have those supplies that were available. And th that's, that, that was the early on. So it, it, was, it was really devastating. And then there were parts of the country that didn't have it. So, you know, we were shutting down hospitals and everything else in parts of the country where it hadn't spread yet. And so there was a lot of confusion about, well, is it real, is it coming or not? Um, and then, I mean, I think what's, what was a real crime is we never learned from any of it. We, we did not have a systematic way. I mean, uh, Betsy did a lot of some of the groundbreaking work with the analysis, but they did it on their own. There was no coordinated effort for funding for, the, you know, a number of people set aside labs to do genetic testing and um, all different work during it, but it was never a coordinated effort across the country. And so we never really learned. And so we also, just didn't know, you know, and we shut down the nursing homes early on, but then the government was really afraid to open them back up. And then we saw the devastating impact that when you lock elderly people in their room, 
they lose weight, get depressed, develop pressure ulcers, and their mobility goes down, which is totally predictable. And that's what we saw happen uh, during the, the pandemic. So that was a double whammy as well. That's really devastating. Um, on that note, and maybe uh, Betsy can turn to you, uh, you know, going back to those first couple of years of the pandemic, there were um, some loud voices in the country advocating for um, that really given the disproportionate effect the virus was having on older Americans, older individuals, um, that we should just focus our response efforts on sheltering or protecting older Americans and that the rest of us should, you know, go out and get infected. Can you, can you, and I, I think we've moved on as a country from that, but you still see those assertions flare up. Um, and I just want to, given your experiences, what you've seen, and you, all three of you can weigh in on this because I want to make sure that we make it clear what is known. Um, what is the, what would have been the feasibility of that? What are your thoughts on those proposals? Yeah, and you know, I completely echo um, Gift's earlier point about ageism and how we kind of perceived that we were protecting older adults, particularly at the beginning, you know, by shutting down um, the nursing homes, not allowing families, family members who are often essential caregivers into the nursing homes to help feed, support their loved ones, um, you know, really had detrimental effects. And I think, you know, when we look more broadly about this and kind of think about lessons learned, you know, there was a real failure at the at the outset of the pandemic to recognize long term cares, not just nursing homes, this is living communities, home care agencies as part of the critical public health infrastructure. And when we think back to a lot of the conversations that we were having in the initial weeks of the pandemic, we were talking about ICU beds, we were talking about ventilators, some of the states were pulling PPE out of the nursing homes and other kind of, um, you know, outpatient care settings, if, if you want to describe them that way, to put them into the hospitals. I mean, we were thinking of the public health response as the inpatient acute care environment. And, you know, it, it just wasn't so long term care, even though, again, a nursing home out in Washington was the initial epicenter of the pandemic. It, it just wasn't part of the initial planning. Like Gift said, um, testing. I mean, nursing homes were struggling just to get tests. We had a, a just a descriptive paper earlier on in the pandemic where um, some uh, nursing home collaborators that we were working with, they were using building floor plans as an infection control strategy. So they were using them to map outbreaks. And they would just, you know, you could see how quickly an outbreak could spread within a nursing home. And they couldn't get... I mean, swabs in the building just to be able to contain the virus, and they had to be very strategic in, you know, how they were allocating resources just to test to identify where the virus was in a building at a given time. Um, you know, we we also did a we did a qualitative study at the outset of the pandemic where we uh, just to get the experience of um, nursing home staff and the number of them that said that you know administrators were trying to you know working with like distilleries to get you know hand sanitizer and you know garbage bags for PPE and, you know, all these like handmade face masks. I mean, it was just, um, you know, again, just a, a real failure at the outset of the pandemic to recognize long-term care as an integral um, part of the public health um, infrastructure. Um, Stefan, anything you want to add to that? Any other perspective? Yeah, I, I think there's an angle to this that uh, is easy to forget. Um, the way we think about respiratory infectious diseases has changed in the last three years. It used to be a paradigm where when somebody gets a cold or something, you can tell and you can have them wear a mask and sneeze into their elbow and so forth and all would be good. Um, and if you get a vaccine, maybe even better. But here we have an infection that uh, shifted the paradigm into something where before vaccine, 40% were without symptoms and could still spread it to other people which meant the idea of you can tell when you need to wear a mask or when you have to keep somebody out of the room was no longer visible. It was now an invisible threat. And, uh, you know, um, I recall when we were washing our vegetables coming in from the yeah. grocery store because we didn't appreciate, uh, you know, what it took to, to keep it out. Now, um, nursing homes, long-term care settings have never worked with this idea that you could have somebody like a family member who might come in and be infected and be an invisible threat to all the residents in the facility because they may transmit it to them and others and then create this outbreak. 
Uh, likewise for staff. You know, staff already have a hard enough time uh, staying home when they're ill because they, they're needed. They know that they're needed in the setting. Um, but uh, if they get uh, sick, you know, often they, they are apt to want to work and mask up and so forth. So I think it's been a huge challenge. And now uh, the mentality in the uh, country has been one where it's no big deal. And to even, uh, you know, to have two standards, one where you have staff that come in and still mask when they see uh, uh, to do their uh, care activities, but families can come in and potentially uh, be infected and spread and don't have to be vaccinated because you don't know, uh, really sets it up to continue this ongoing uh, challenge for the setting. I think, can I just add Jennifer? Please I do, think, please jump in, yeah. I'm gonna say the one thing I noticed, that this is, the COVID challenged a lot of traditional um, accepted sort of philosophy and practices. As Stefan said, most public health infection control is based on a symptom-based approach. Yeah. And, 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 and we could not pivot away from a system-based approach. Um, we're struggling with that right now with enhanced barrier precautions and MDROs, moving away from a diagnostic-based approach to uh, uh, how to manage that. I would say the other is, is as, as Stefan said, we had a philosophy that if you had a respiratory virus that's out there, influenza, adenovirus, RSV, yeah, that was not that bad. We all get a hold of it. But if you look at the data, every winter, mm -hmm. the mortality rate in nursing homes goes up by 30%. From December through March, it jumps by 30%. It's about two to 3,000 deaths per, per week <clears throat> go up. That's been going on for 10 years. We, that we just accepted that. And I think the challenge is we're back to that cycle now with mm -hmm. vaccines and the latest version of COVID. And that's why we're having trouble getting the vaccine rates up because everyone's like, yeah, yeah, it's kind of what we normally have. And they, they, no one sees the terribleness of deaths and hospitalizations that are going on anymore um, at you know, personal experience. I think the other the other philosophy that we, we tra fell into is that vaccines, as we see in the movies and everything else, they prevent you from getting infected. And that's been the message we've had all along. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this vaccine was just unbelievably effective at that early on. And I think it blew all our minds away with that. And, and, we, and we fell into that lull that our messaging was about preventing infection. Now it still prevents infection, but it's not nearly as effective, but the real value is preventing you from getting seriously ill and dying. And it's been hard for public health to shift that messaging. And yeah. so that has contributed yeah. to the problem. And then last I'd say is the public health philosophy is always about access and is about um, awareness. Mm -hmm. Vaccine in this setting right now, access and awareness is not a problem. Yet all we hear every day when we get a call from media, from policymakers, from government officials is, we need to do something more. And every suggestion is how to address access and address awareness. It's, that's, not, that's not the problem. And the CDC just came out with a study, uh, a, a poll the other day, 95% of elderly over the age of 65 in the community are aware that they need to have gotten the vaccine. And many of them have been told by the doctor to get the vaccine. And 30% of them said, there's no way they're getting the vaccine. And, and so this is not an awareness access problem, yet that's where we keep going back to is public health because we can't get out of our own philosophy. Just like the symptom-based approach that Stefan mentioned. So let's talk about vaccine. And um, and just before we get into the, the, the challenges, just where, so we, we sketched out where the critical vulnerabilities of older Americans, nursing home residents um, in that first year of COVID we get the vaccines and a number of you reference those vaccines being, you know, game changers. Um, can we just kind of like set the ground for um, what have these vaccines accomplished um, and where are we now in terms of the vulnerability of the, of not just nursing home residents, but also um, older Americans um, out in the community from COVID. We know from the vaccine statistics that there was a high initial uptake of one and two doses of the vaccine, but here we are a couple of years later, where are we now in terms of vulnerability? Um, I love sort of all three of you to kind of weigh in on that. And then you you referenced some lingering vulnerability and we wanna talk about that too, but just can we kind of set the stage of what the vaccines have been able to accomplish, but where are we now in terms of, of levels of protection? 
Um, Betsy, we could start with you. I was actually going to throw it to Stefan first. Okay, we'll start with Stefan. That's why. <laughs> Great. So, so uh, just high level numbers, um, uh, vaccination versus not vaccination, even if it's not all the boosts is roughly an 18 fold reduction in likelihood of dying. Uh, if you've got it's pretty extraordinary. We have to just like make sure folks understand how extraordinary 18 times. Is. Yeah, it's yeah. not like having or quartering. That's just getting vaccine, just getting it on board. And then if you if you have somebody who's vaccinated and they get the most recent uh, updated bivalent booster, that reduces the risk another uh, fifty percent more from just having gotten the first round of shots. So um, now having said all of that, which is a pretty amazing thing for a vaccine to do, uh, dying from COVID in this eighty plus age group is still two to three times more likely than dying from flu. Um, and so, uh, and can so, you unpack us for just a little bit on yeah. that? Is that a function of the virus or a function of the prevalence of the virus compared to our flu season? Can you say a little bit more about that? So, um, so there's a there's a few assumptions here about what the virus is doing, and you know that the virus has been changing uh, from month to month. You know, so we went from starting off with a Wuhan-like strain through D two sixty four, and then Delta, and so forth. And now we're on the third generation of an Omicron strain, uh, the, the uh, BA2 descendant. XBB is leaving the country and CH11 is arriving. So um, every time the virus uh, changes to escape that population immunity, it's doing things that increase its ability to evade the immune response, including protection from what the vaccines have given. I think if there were any silver lining in that uh, sort of frightening message that it will keep changing is that some of the changes it's making are increasingly back to things that were present in earlier strains. We call that convergence. And that means that we will probably get to a place where um, a vaccine will have broader protection because we're getting smarter about how to make them. Now, uh, go ahead. I was just going to say, just to make it clear, because you gave those stunning statistics and you talked, you bet you referenced the booster, but I just want to make it clear for people who are watching why we're even talking about boosters in the first place um, and and the potential benefit in this particular population that we're talking about. Yeah. So so the bivalent booster, if you've gotten your one or two prior boosts, uh, reduces your risk of dying if you're 80 or over by half. And uh, it also reduces your risk for, for getting uh, long COVID. So for those people who have gotten infected, and I think we will all eventually get infected. I don't think it's a question of whether, I think it's a question of when. And the only thing we can do is, is control how, uh, what that infection looks like. So the vaccine, if it's doing its job, uh, you won't ever feel sick. You will have an asymptomatic infection that goes by and you'll never even know that it happened. If it's somewhat effective, you still might get a runny nose or something like that or a, a sore throat or something and nothing more than that. And um, and at its worst, uh, maybe uh, you'll keep from dying or being hospitalized. Vaccines can do all of those things. And um, it doesn't mean you that res these rescue drugs that are out there, uh, Paxlovid would be one of them, don't offer added benefit. They specifically offer an added benefit to this older population. So... Uh, Gift yeah. looks like he's ready to say something. I was going to say something. One thing, I totally agree with your, your all your statistics, Stefan. One thing that we're starting to see is uh, it's somewhat backfiring because the percent, discussing this as a percent reduction hmm. when the baseline mortality rate and hospitalization rate has changed so much that people aren't believing it. So that, you know, when 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 you had a mortality rate of 20 percent and you say you can reduce it by 18, you know, 18 fold or cut it down, th they saw that. Yeah. yeah, they don't now they're just not seeing it anymore. So, yes, you can cut hospitalization and mortality down by another 50 percent with the bivalent. And the data is really clear on that. But you're talking about a much, much lower mortality rate at the baseline. And since some people aren't seeing it. They're like, well, I don't see it as effect. I don't even see it anymore, so I don't need it. So it, it, we, I think we have to, on the public health side, figure out how to change the messaging from a percent reduction to some sort of like the way you were describing just now and, and think about how to describe that in a different way. Because it, it's, it's not, the current message of percent reduction is not working. 
People don't realize that more than 300 deaths per day is a still a high number, but compared to where it had been, and and given the fact that it's distributed over the country, there it, that that acute emergency isn't as visible as it once was earlier in in the pandemic. That uh, that seems to be what you're saying, correct? Well, yeah. I mean, in in our setting right now, the deaths the deaths are now. 300, roughly 250, 300 per week across 15,000 nursing homes. Yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, that's the, the 300 deaths are for the general population, I think. Right. I don't know. So in the nursing home setting, at least the the data gets reported every week. You're, ta you're talking about 200 deaths per per week across 15,000 nursing homes. That's but very that's different. Still, that's still probably an, an undercount. Yeah. Well, I, and... and and I'm not, I don't, that's 200 deaths too many and everything else. I, I don't mean to minimize it. I'm just saying that that's the baseline people are seeing. I mean, if you look back beginning in 2020 and in 2021, there were, you were talking about a much higher rate of death rate that you were seeing that. And, and so let's un make incredibly clear why, where we are, which still has more work to be done, more urgency to do more, why we aren't where we were um, clear the vaccines have played an extraordinary role. I, I just, I, I'm, I'm hammering this point home because there's so much confusion on the internet in it's, you know, people, people get confused and even talking to my own relatives and loved ones who are older about why it is important they, that they continue to stay up to date with their their vaccination. So, so I, I can think of three reasons off the bat. Um, one of them is when you get infected, and don't know it, you can still give it to other people. And your likelihood of getting infected, even if it doesn't erase it, it reduces that risk a bit. The vaccine re reduces it, yeah. And so when you're visiting your parents or your grandparents or, or your newborn infant or something like that, your odds of giving it to them go down uh, dramatically. But if you're an older American and you're listening to this right now, or you know an older American, you very strongly recommend that they, um, if they haven't yet gotten it, they get their bivalent booster. Yeah. Yeah, because because otherwise they run the risk both of getting hospitalized themselves or being a silent vector to somebody that they love who might be a solid organ transplant. They don't even know. And I'm going to extend what you just said in terms of the benefits to others who, even if you're not in that high risk group for severe illness, you're not over the age of 65. It's probably more like over the age of 50. Um, there are benefits to you. But can we extend that to um, staff and, and um, employees of nursing homes? Or it other works. other older yeah sure others. it works in both directions um, the staff not giving it to the residents and the residents not giving it to the staff so both groups have to get vaccinated vaccinating one and the other um, uh, makes it much less effective at stemming the amount of infection you'll see in a facility so given that we saw a high initial uptake of the vaccines and we are seeing um, disappointingly low uptake of the boosters um, across the board, but even con most concerningly among the patients who would most benefit from it, those are people over the age of 65, and we're seeing disappointingly high uptake in nursing home residents. Um, David, you, 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 didn't more, you did more than hint at the reason why, but is it your view that this is primarily a problem of lack of demand, lack of desire, lack of wanting to get it more so than a lack of access? No, absolutely. Uh, and, and to be honest, I can't understand why. Yeah. I'm a believer of vaccine and believer. And so I think uh, it's clear we we talk to the providers all the time. We were trying to do root cause analysis to understand how to fix this problem. And um, you know there are regulations in place that we have to offer and educate every person who gets admitted in the nursing home about the vaccine. So everyone's getting offered it. The federal government has purchased and made a special allocation to long-term care pharmacies. So there's there's no trouble accessing. We don't we there was a little bit of trouble at one point. Um, when they're transitioning from early on in 2021, but we, we just don't get calls from nursing homes about trouble accessing the vaccine. So neither of those are problems. Mm -hmm. it, it, what we hear over and over again is they don't want it. And, and so the solution has to be, how do we do better motivational interviewing mm -hmm. or and motivational discussion with it? it? It was reminding me, um, 
of what we do as physicians on trying to address smoking, uh, exercise, and diet. You know, so behavior change models that work. Yeah. 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 And, and, Can I ask yeah, you? Uh, no one wants to do that because yeah. it takes a long time to do that. Sorry. I'm wondering, Betsy. Betsy, you did a study recently looking at, at vaccine uptake among nursing home staff. Um, do you have any insights for why we are in this problem where we're just not seeing the kind of uptake of the boosters that are really urgent for protecting um, these populations? So we um, so we looked at vaccination testing employment data for um, a few hundred nursing homes around the primary vaccine clinics. So those were clinics um, the federal government had coordinated with some of the retail pharmacies to get vaccine clinics into nursing homes around the country as a way to um, you know help bring those resources to, to that setting. Um, one of the things that we observed is that we saw um, lower rates of vaccination uh, when at, for night shift and evening shift staff than we saw for day shift staff. And I think it speaks to you know when we're thinking about the implementation of these processes, um, you know those were clinics that, were run during the day. So if you were on the evening shift or the night shift, you either had to come in early, stay late, or come in on a day off to get vaccinated. Um, and, you know, as Gift said, you know, there's we're in a different place now in terms of nursing homes having access to the vaccines. Um, but we just, you know, when we're thinking about these kind of mass vaccination campaigns, we really need to think about implementation and we need to make it as easy as possible, you know, behavioral economics 101, you know, the default needs to be that you're getting the vaccine and it has to be, mm -hmm. you know, readily available to you. You shouldn't have to come in on a different shift. Um, you know, access is, is uh, the implementation of these processes is, is quite important. Um, the, the one other thing, and just kind of linking back to the, uh, some of the other comments around, you know, why, why we're having more challenges around the bivalent booster versus the primary series. You know, I think there was collective recognition with the primary vaccination, that, that these vaccines were life-saving. Everybody was waiting for them. They came out, um, you know, there was this like kind of mass deployment and I think they were easy to understand. Now we're at a much different point in the pandemic where, you know, in terms of public health communication, when you have to communicate when you're using the words monovalent versus bivalent in public health communication, you're in a very different place. Um, and that makes it much harder for people to recognize why they continue to need these. And particularly when you throw in like first monovalent booster, second monovalent booster, and then a bivalent booster, it, you know, it's just, it's, it's people, pandemic fatigue is real. And, you know, it's, it can be really hard for people to kind of wrap their brains around why do I need this next dose? Um, so. So what do you, what is your answer to that question? Why do I need the next dose? I just want to make this really clear because of what you just said. I mean, I, I think, and particularly when we're talking about older adults, we, yeah. and, and this is from work that, that Stefan and I do, where we're, we're monitoring antibody response in nursing home residents longitudinally as, as they're getting each of the boosters. We see that older adults are much, and particularly frail older adults, have much more waning of their immunity after a vaccine dose. So the subsequent doses and being up to date is really important to maintain adequate levels of immune protection against the virus. And particularly as we see, you know, more and more variants, um, it, it's really critically important to be up to date with vaccination. It's, it's one other thing that happens with each of those additional doses. It takes several doses for the immune system to be able to recognize uh, strains that are not in the vaccine. So uh, the third dose, the fourth dose, actually started broadening the immunity so that there was some protection against Omicron, even though Omicron wasn't in it. Yeah. The bivalent does it even more so. So uh, unfortunately, it, it isn't like um, some of the vaccines that kids get where you're two or three vaccines and then done. This is something where you need to keep up with it and it'll probably be an annual vaccine starting this year. Um, Jennifer, I just, want, I just have to acknowledge ahead. both Stefan and, yep. and, and Betsy and, and, and the School of Public Health at Brown was really vital to helping us throughout the pandemic and the providers. I mean, the research and the reports that were coming out, the sharing of the data, it really was valuable. It helped, it helped change a lot of minds at our end. Um, thank you for saying that. One of the reasons why we want to do these series is to make sure in an age where anyone can appoint themselves an expert on a given topic that we uh, connect the 
a community of people who are in need of information with people with the actual expertise. So thank you for um, uh, uh, testifying to that. Um, we have a lot of questions that are starting to um, mount and I wanna, I wanna turn to them, but um, I also wanna just make sure I queue up for conversation um, therapeutics and particularly Paxlovid and the role that um, it is playing now or, or the role that it could be playing now and what we need to do um, with respect to, to making sure we can fully avail ourselves of, of the benefits of that. And whoever wants to chime in on that um, first, well, and then we'll turn to the questions that have been coming in. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to start. So um, as our audience probably knows, Paxlovid is uh, one of the medications that's been shown to reduce the risk for hospitalization, especially if it's given within the first uh, five days of becoming symptomatic. There hasn't been evidence that you can give it before you can, uh, if you if you start giving it before you have symptoms, the evidence doesn't yet exist to say whether that improves outcomes. As far as we're concerned, you you need to wait until symptoms before you start. The second thing is that Paxlovid is is not um, the simplest drug to give because it has significant interactions with other medications. And many uh, of the older adults who live in these long-term care settings are often on many medications. So there's been a lot of hesitancy for doctors to just, or practitioners to just prescribe Paxlovid because they're worried about these drug-drug um, interactions and how to do it safely. It turns out there's only a few drugs where you absolutely can't give it. So there is a nuance. And, um, and I think one of the things we have to do is help uh, the prescribers recognize how to partner with their pharmacist to help guide them through what kind of changes they need to make to to give it safely. Not hard to do, it, it's an extra step. And I think that uh, creates a lot of reluctance for it to be prescribed in the outpatient setting in general. Uh, it's not the only medication out there. There's others too. Uh, uh, I think the most pressed has been on Paxlovid because it's the most effective of those uh, early in the course of illness. Uh, and uh, in the hospital setting, of course, there's other drugs or when people have uh, low oxygen, there's steroids and things that we do too. So I think that's the front end of the Paxlovid question. So you referenced that it sounds like they're being it, these treatments are being underutilized and any um, thoughts on, aside from the provider education piece, would there be anything that could make that easier to, to reduce the disincentives to use or uh, in some way Im improve improve utilization of it? The, the messaging, the messaging has been a significant problem mm -hmm. of the, yeah, the early on about all the uh, drug drug interactions, yeah. and and a majority of those drug drug interactions, my understanding are theoretical lab based, mouse based, right. and really not occur. But there's no distinction on the, the on that sort of warning, and so what we hear is a lot of doctors will not prescribe them in our population, or they want to wait till they get sick which, you know, avoids the benefit of it of, and starting in the first five days. And, and so that has that? scared everyone like, away. Who can fix that? Like who, is there is there a mechanism that you wish were utilized to educate caregivers? Is there an, is there a, a regulatory pathway? Is, is there, do you know a pathway to fix that? The, the FDA listing is, does not differentiate the magnitude and the real risk or not. And and we need to we need to have that mm -hmm. in a, in a better way. And I think there's a challenge with how we we list it. I, I know I know that some some people at the School of Public Health there at Brown are really uh, um, really looking at this question of drug drug interactions and what's real and what's not and what's meaningful because in this population you know the average nursing home resident's on between nine and ten medications and 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 they're on many more. So it just scares people away. From a very effective medication, and as Ashish Jha has said, you know it's really only a limited number. And he he went around and got a much more limited list that really was meaningful, but that hasn't gotten out and been able to get out uh, widely to the community. It, it it that broader issue. Maybe we need to hire like the uh, commercials where they have the wonderful people, and then it's all in fine print, and they read it really fast. All the complications at the end, and everyone ignores it. So they have that feel good. I feel like the Paxlovid led with these complications and we cannot get people to prescribe it. Okay. Um, we have about 
a little under 15 minutes. We're going to lose um, Stefan um, between a few minutes early for his next um, uh, appointment, but um, I'm going to turn to the questions now and maybe if we could kind of try to briefly answer them so we can get through as many as possible. Um, one of the first questions here is about, has there been any conversations about using building wastewater analysis and long-term care facilities in nursing homes as a potential early warning system and referencing not just COVID, but other other pathogens like influenzas? Yeah, any, for, is that uh, off at all? I'll just do a, a one sentence, maybe Betsy or Gif have more. Um, there, certainly there's been discussion and I think it's an approach uh, I don't know of, of anyone that's been able to standardize how that works. There's a lot of little details in both getting the samples done and, and having confidence that you can, that, that the results are actionable. Yeah. Okay. Um, next question. Uh, the American Rescue Plan incorporated Senator Whitehouse's COVID-19 Nursing Home Protection Act to provide funding for infection control assistance um, known as and organizing local health and emergency workers known as surge teams to manage COVID outbreaks. Um, it references more money authorized by the ARP. And basically the question is, did this have an impact? It would have had more of an impact if it was done earlier. And I know Senator Whitehouse tried to get it done much earlier. I think by the time that this came out, we had seen the vaccine was out and it was less of an issue. I think, um, it's also taken a long time to figure out how to mobilize that money, but staffing shortages are a huge problem right now, as Betsy can attest. And uh, the, but they haven't figured out how to use that money to really come in and help with the staffing shortage. Um, it was designed. It was really designed to fund strike force teams early on when there was massive problems, and it, they haven't been able to figure out how to pivot to use it to either support vaccine. Well, some they tried to pivot to support vaccine clinics, mm -hmm. but that, that goes to the concept we were talking about before. It, that's an access availability problem and that wasn't the problem. And so there was not a lot of uptake from it. Uh, it's being used to help, I think, um, a bunch of staffing issues that I think would be very beneficial. So I think we're gonna see the benefit of it longer term, but not right away. What about- uh, Betsy, the, I don't know you. Uh, sorry, go ahead, Betsy. Well, I was just gonna add, so, you know, when we're talking about surge teams like that's very much a crisis management strategy i mean that's talking about like bringing in the national guard or bringing in like um you know emergency nurses to help support like a, a critical shortage but i mean throughout the pandemic when you look at um employment recovery like when you look at the borough labor statistics numbers um for employment across different healthcare sectors um you know there's been significant rebound in every other sector except long-term care. I mean, long-term care has just been, um, you know, cases or um, employment has ha has really dropped. So, you know, we're facing the the long-term consequences of all, you know, all the, you know, yes, there were resources to manage like, you know, the crisis time when we were in outbreaks and, you know, kind of get staff, get, get people into the buildings to, um, you know, get through and, a, a particularly bad outbreak, but, you know, all the strain that that has had on the, the workforce, you know, that's had very long term consequences on the workforce and, and the strain in this setting. And, and so we really need to be thinking about how to support the workforce, you know, on a much longer lens. I was going to broaden that question a little bit to ask, and I'm glad you you pointed out that that was that's a crisis response. But what are the resources available to these facilities for prevention? for protection, for the day-to-day -day things to prevent the outbreaks in the first place? Zero. And that was true. We are fortunately at a bit of a lull right now in terms of, of respiratory pathogens, but a few weeks ago in the fall, early winter, we were not with um, you know multiple uh, serious respiratory pathogens circulating in communities and zero even then. I mean, there, there's there's allocation of the vaccine and there's allocation of the medications, um, but testing support testing. Oh, uh, I take that back. They, yeah, the administration has continued to provide tests to nursing homes and assisted living uh, to supplement their testing needs, and that has been that has been very very helpful. Yeah, and is that absolutely. Preventive I, I take, testing I take, or just what? symptoms based testing. 
Uh, no, they 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 send them antigen tests. And they can use them on whoever and however they want to. Um, and that's and that's been very very helpful. Yeah. No, I, I take will that. Will that back. continue? Take... Will that continue? Yes, they they have said that that will continue uh, indefinitely into the future. And I, and my understanding is they have a lot of tests still, and so it'll continue for some time. I, there's an interesting question: is is all the testing did it help? Mm -hmm. and, and I I don't know. It's an interesting question. I mean, I think uh, the modeling in public health would suggest it should work, and in the theory, it should work. But it's really clear that people do not understand incubation period. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the testing and even some of the cohorting recommendations early on facilitated spread in the nursing homes. I, I can't prove it specifically, but I can tell you in talking to people, it's clear people do not understand incubation period and do not understand how to interpret test results. Um, so, so not just the tools, but but also having the the operational strategies to, to optimize the use of the tools. Yeah. Yeah. Seven. Yeah. So I'll just say I have, I have to get off, but I'll just say uh, it depends on the test. You know, so when we have antigen based tests that can miss an infection that's uh, currently occurring because it hasn't hit the threshold for what the test is designed to do. Yeah. You may get a false sense of security. Uh, the PCR testing is pretty good, but it's expensive. And uh, the, the facilities can't bear the burden of the PCR test. That needs to be uh, carried by an insurance program or through public health funds. Well, and every time there was a surge, the, the delay in the PCR test, you got the results back, you know, 72, yeah. 96 so, hours later. But there is a solution to that, and that is that uh, there are now point of care PCR tests. Oh, yeah. But again, there's infrastructure. You have to teach them how to use these CLIA wave yeah. tests and so forth. So. Uh, but I think there's a strategy where tests could work. It's just not uh, ready for prime time yet. So thanks for having me. I'm going to sign off. Thanks. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we have a few minutes left, and I'm just scrolling here. One question I would like to make sure you all address, which is sort of you referenced early on the sort of how nursing homes were seen as not necessarily integral part of, of our overall healthcare ecosystem, and those interdependencies weren't really referenced. Um, and there's a question here about um, what would you recommend as top priority priorities for improving government public health infrastructure um, to support nursing homes and other and elder care pop locations for pandemics? I'm also going to extend that to just seniors in general, older Americans, um, because it's not you know we we have a larger population here to talk about. Um, so, um, in the few minutes that we have, Betsy and Gif, um, you know, if you got put in charge of fixing these problems like what would be your your punch list of, of things that you you would like to do and i'll take let whoever wants to go first go first so i'll take the first pass at the and then i'm uh, i'm sure gif has much more to say too um so i would just say very broadly that we have to talk about nursing homes assisted living communities home health agencies as being part of our healthcare system so if we have another respiratory pathogen pandemic, that means prioritizing those areas to get PPE, to get high quality PPE, including N95s, um, to get, you know, appropriate testing materials, prioritizing those settings for vaccines. Um, I mean, we just have to shift the conversation um, and recognize that a home health aide is a healthcare worker, a CNA working in a nursing home, a kitchen aide working in a in a nursing home. These are health, essential healthcare workers, and they need the same protection as being as is being provided to the uh, acute care sector. And you know, the public health infrastructure has to respond to you know support those populations. And then, GIF, I'm sure you have. Some and GIF, I'm going to tack onto your your question also um improving demand for vaccines if you have any any insights on on what could help well I, I think that you know you can't you can't fix systematic problems in the middle of an emergency but at the same time as you start to address them you need to be thinking about building long term and so many of the things during the covid were workarounds that were not building towards the long term and so i think to betsy's point it is part of a broader system i mean it, even the fact that 80, 90% of all admissions to nursing homes come from the hospital and almost all, none of them are getting vaccinated in the hospital. Yeah. 
And and so, but everyone turns to the nursing home and say, why aren't you vaccinating? Well, no one's turning to the hospital saying, why aren't you vaccinating? And, um, and so there's this, there's, there's a need to be a change in that. I would say looking at the system, I mean, that we have not been part of the immunization um, network. And, and it's not easy to get us in the network. And it, it turns out the state immunization registries are um, all different. They don't talk to each other. And, and, and so how are we, we need to build that system up for the public in general. We've done it for kids and we have really high vaccination rates and states that use those systems really work well. States that like Rhode Island that buy the vaccines and then distribute them to pediatric offices and do turnover. I mean, the same with these supplies. When we when we went to get PPE, a lot of it was outdated. Some states, and I know Rhode Island does this, where they use their stockpile, and when hospitals needed masks, they would get it from the stockpile, and the stockpile would then get the new mask. So we would be cycling it out. So we would, you know, use inventory management. And so there has to be a public-private partnership to managing inventory management for these critical supplies in whatever emergency, whether it be a hurricane or a pandemic. To do that, and you can't build that right away, uh, but we need to be building that. We need to be building that process. Um, you know, there's a saying in, in military: you, they drill the way they fight. We don't drill the way we practice for these issues, and and how we incorporate that process is really key. And it's going to take some resources and time. And uh, and then I think to your question about how do we address the demand issue, uh, we've got to get away from access and awareness mentality and think about, it. I mean, the access thing was solved by the long-term care pharmacy partnership. It was a beautiful, lovely program. That's not the type of thing that you need right away. And we shouldn't have had to build that in the first place. So how do we build a system that you can take advantage of and, and work right away? And I think that's the questions and uh, challenges. As far as the demand issue, we need to be thinking about training the, uh, clinical community on how how are they having discussions to understand why the, the demand is low and begin to address that and then feeding that back to the public health agencies so they can retailer their message to address that and address the demand because I see a disconnect between the message and a message that actually tends to undermine the very intent we want and we're not learning from that. And you'd say that's the same for residents and staff as well? Yeah. I mean, no one's talking about, Stefan mentioned it briefly, and we mentioned long COVID briefly, but, you know, long COVID is going to be a big problem. I mean, you're talking 10, 20% of people getting it. Vaccine reduces it by about 30%. You know, no one really, I, I, it's going to be very fascinating to watch what happens with long COVID over the long haul. <laughs> and it's very hard to measure. It's very hard to measure. Yeah. 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 Well, really, thank you both. And thanks to Stefan. Um, the three of you really are top thought leaders and practitioners and are really, you know, on the front lines, very grateful to you for those efforts and for being willing to come here and share your insights with us. Um, I, um, we didn't get through all the questions, but if anyone um, is as urgent issues, please uh, send them to us and we'll try to see if we can get answers for you. Um, but I do hope that those who are um, watching recognize your particular expertise on these issues, um, because as, as you rightly alluded, we were going to be dealing with this, these challenges um, for the long term, not just COVID, but all the respiratory viruses that come. So very grateful to you for your time. I'm very grateful to those who um, showed up to watch this webinar. We're going to be um, um, we've recorded it and we'll be sharing it widely. Um, and I'm also really grateful to our staff here, the Brown Pandemic Center, Leah Lovegren, Bentley Holt, and Aquiel Person for their efforts in pulling together this webinar. We hope to make this a monthly series on different topics. Um, and frankly, where we are in the pandemic, I couldn't imagine a more pertinent, urgent topic to talk about than protecting older Americans. So thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much.